Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 448th episode, we're talking all about the dinosauroid of great infamy. Yes. <laughs> and to go along with the dinosauroid, we're also going to talk about some news related to Troodon, like that Troodon was a brooder. Not that it was moody, but that it took care of its nests. <laughs> yeah, presumably. We don't know that much about its mood. We also have a paper on whether or not Shixalub is what killed off the dinosaurs, and therefore what would have happened if they hadn't gone extinct. You could extrapolate it that way if you're thinking about dinosauroids, as well as a neuroscientist take on if dinosaurs could become as smart as humans. If they hadn't died off from the Chicxulub impact. Yeah. And we have Dinosaur of the Day, Stenonicosaurus, as well as a dinosaur connection challenge to politics, breaking our rule of not talking about politics on this show. But we promise it won't be too political. It's very dinosaur related. <laughs> yeah. And of course, we have a fun fact, which is about butterflies and dinosaurs. But before we get into all of that, of course, we want to thank some of our patrons for being the driving force, keeping I Know Dino running. And this week, we'd like to thank Taya, Amato Titan, Quadrosaurus, Kentrosaurus, Rocco Raptor, Dragon Feathers, Adam, Riker Tattoo, Melina and Manoli, and Saskisaurus. Yes, thank you so much for being part of our community. As Garrett was saying, our patrons... Our fellow die know it alls are a big part of why we're able to keep this show going. Absolutely. All right, we're switching things up this week. Instead of starting with the news, we're going to start with the dinosaur of the day, and it's because it all loosely connects to the dinosauroid. It's weird. I don't know about this starting with the dinosaur of the day business. Well, we're trying something out, <laughs> we're trying to keep to a theme. So the dinosaur of the day is Stenonicosaurus, which was a request from PaleoMike716 via our Patreon and Discord, so thank you. It was a troodontid theropod that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Alberta, Canada, found in the Dinosaur Park Formation. It was possibly also found in the Two Medicine Formation. It looked like other small theropods with the long tail. It was probably covered in feathers. It had that S-curved neck, short arms, long legs. And as a troodontid, it had the sickle-shaped claws on the second toes of each foot. Stenonicosaurus was estimated to be about 8.2 feet, 2.5 meters long, and weighs 77 pounds or 35 kilograms. It had long, slender legs, so it may have been a fast runner. The tail was flexible at the base, and that may have helped it turn while walking or running and it had large eyes and binocular vision. It was able to grasp and hold objects. It possibly reached adult size between three and five years old, and that's based on a troodont found in two medicine formation. Stenonicosaurus was also possibly an omnivore, and its teeth were different compared to other theropods. It had jaws similar to an iguana's, and iguanas eat plants, and the teeth had large serrations. In 1988, Tom Holtz and Daniel Brinkman found that troodontid teeth had larger denticles than other theropods, and that the serration scaling is what made it so confusing on how to classify troodon when it was first described. Both Stenonicosaurus and troodon have been lumped and split in the past, mm -hmm. and troodon was named from a single tooth back in 1856, another reason why it's so confusing. That is very confusing. Yes. If you want to hear more about Troodon specifically, we did talk about it in episode 36. <laughs> it's been a while. It has been a while. So Holtz and Brinkman suggested that Troodon would have also eaten eggs and invertebrates, like worms, and others have suggested that Troodontids ate insects. The type and only species of Stenonicosaurus is Stenonicosaurus inequalis. The genus name means narrow claw lizard. It was named by Charles M. Sternberg in 1932, and he described a left foot, parts of a hand, and some tail vertebrae. When he was describing it, he wrote, quote, Observant collectors and students of vertebrate paleontology who have studied the Belly River and Edmonton faunas fully realize that, in spite of the many fine dinosaurian specimens which have been collected from these beds in recent years, many forms are still imperfectly known. Perhaps the light-limbed theropods are among the least known of these dinosaurs, end quote. Sternberg found that Stenonicosaurus 
closely resembled Ornitholestes, but Stynonicosaurus was bigger and had some differences in the tail and feet. He also wrote, quote, The structure of both the front and hind feet of Stenonychosaurus seems to suggest that it should be regarded as a direct descendant of Ornitholestes, though the difference in the caudal vertebrae might be against this suggestion, end quote. And he ended that there was a need to find more complete specimens or more fossils to learn more. Gotta find more fossils. Hashtag more fossils <laughs> way before hashtags. Yeah. Or at least before they were used that way. Now, over the years, Stenonychosaurus has been reassigned and reclassified. Russell at one point synonymized Polyodontosaurus and Ornithomimus altus as Stynonychosaurus, but said that there wasn't enough evidence to synonymize them with Troodon. Carpenter later synonymized Polyodontosaurus, Stenonychosaurus, Ornithomimus altus, and Troodon formosus as Sorornithoides inequalis. And Phil Curry synonymized Stenonychosaurus and Pectinodon under Troodon formosus. Curry found that the differences in the teeth and jaws of troodontids were based on age and position of the tooth in the jaw instead of being a feature of different species. So he reclassified Stenonychus as troodon and reclassified other troodontids as troodon formosus. Although we're basing all this on just one tooth for troodon, so... Yes. Although we keep hearing that there are more troodon fossils out there and they just haven't been published yet. Yeah. Or maybe it's this sort of thing where it's like, well, there are more troodonts. We've just called them by different names before. (laughs) Mm. Sounds like we're due for another paper. I think so. But later, other scientists, including Curry, thought that there might be more troodonted species. And they ended up splitting out dinosaur park formation fossils that used to be Stynonychosaurus as troodon inequalis. In 2011, Lindsay Zano and others analyzed how troodontids were classified and found all the specimens assigned to troodon formosus were probably different species, and since the holotype of troodon is a tooth, troodon itself may be a nomum dubium, which is always strange when you've got a group of troodontids, mm-hmm. but then the, the animal it was named for, troodon, might be not valid. Yeah. It wouldn't be the first time, but it is always unfortunate when that happens. Yes. In 2017, Evans and others agreed that the holotype of Troodon wasn't unique enough and suggested reviving Stenonychosaurus for troodonted fossils that were found in dinosaur park formation. Also in 2017, Aaron Van Der Reest and Phil Curry found Troodon formosus to no longer be valid. Oh, really? That's a big update since we did our Troodon dinosaur of the day, because I feel like Phil Curry was one of the ones that was really into Troodon back then. I think it's still an ongoing debate, though. Yeah. They studied a troodontid pelvis that Van der Reest had found in 2014 in Dinosaur Provincial Park, which led to him examining troodontid skull fossils. And that led to Van der Reest and Curry resurrecting Stenonychosaurus inequalis and naming Latinovenetrix McMaster. They reassigned a lot of the Stenonychosaurus fossils to the new dinosaur, Latinovenetrix. And we covered that as a news item in episode 144. So we might have talked about what they found with Troodon back then, too. Yeah. There are definitely a lot of Troodon fans out there, though. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They also talked about how it seemed unlikely for all those fossils to belong to Troodon because that would mean that Troodon spanned 15 million years and has been found in what is now Mexico all the way up to what's now Alaska. (laughs) That is a very long time and a long range for one genus. Yes. Then in 2021, a study by Thomas Cullen and others found that Latin Venetrix was actually a junior synonym to Stenonychosaurus. So that was a short-lived dinosaur. The differences in features were due to individual variation. So a lot of lumping and splitting still happening up until pretty recently. Yeah, with such fragmentary dinosaurs, (laughs) if people are studying them, there's a lot of room for interpretation. Yes. All right, now the, for the part that we've been teasing for a while. So in 1969, Dale Russell described a more complete Stenonychosaurus skeleton, and this skeleton was the basis for a life-size sculpture of Stenonychosaurus and a sculpture of the famous, or maybe infamous, dinosauroid. Yeah. Infamous is probably the better word. <laughs> <laughs> In 1982, Russell and Seguin did a thought experiment on what Stenonychosaurus would look like if it had continued evolving until today. And they wrote, quote, Stenonychosaurus was a highly progressive animal for its day. 
And they also said, quote, it might also be entertaining to speculate in a qualitative manner on how the descendants of Stenonicosaurus inequalis might have appeared had they survived the terminal Mesozoic extinctions, end quote, and if they evolved to have an EQ similar to humans. That's the encephalization quotient. They said that over time, the EQ relative to brain weight compared to body weight in dinosaurs increased. And they found that while a troodontid skull had a low EQ compared to a human, it was a lot higher compared to other dinosaurs. It had a large brain. So they're basically like taking a trend line of, look, they're getting smarter and just extrapolating it way out millions of years of evolution. Tens of millions of years, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so they suggested, hey, if Stenonicosaurus have kept evolving until today, it could have an EQ similar to a human's. They also thought... This is where we get into the dinosauroidiness of it, that the large brain would lead to it having evolving to have a shorter face and eventually being toothless and having a short neck to support this larger brain. And then eventually it would walk like a human and have a partially opposed finger on each hand. And that's based on the fact that Stenonychosaurus could grasp. Being upright would also mean no more tail or maybe just a stump of a tail. So this dinosauroid looked very human-like. If you search online for images, I think it looks like a sci-fi alien with the large eyes. It's very much a little green man-looking thing. Yeah. You can't look at it and think anything other than they started with a person and made it look like a dinosaur rather than starting with a dinosaur and using like principles of evolution to come up with the most likely scenario. Well, it's funny you bring that up because that's exactly what they said. They argued humans have the best body shape for our big brains. So that's why Stenonychosaurus would potentially evolve to look more human, but they did allow that they might be biased. I mean, dolphins and whales have way bigger brains. So why not argue that dinosaurs would have evolved to be aquatic because we know a lot of dinosaurs did become aquatic mm, so shouldn't they point. just be like weird dinosaur dolphins <laughs> or something <laughs> i think they're kind of just having fun with this i think so too they said it was a thought experiment and mm -hmm. i think it was meant to provoke discussion which it has led to many discussions we're still talking about it like 40 years later yeah they also imagined that the dinosauroid would give live birth instead of laying eggs because it's got the larger brain power, or, you know, to give it the larger brain power, the larger brains and heads like humans, and they imagined it would feed the baby's regurgitated food. They ended their paper with, quote, the presence of this body form in Homo sapiens demonstrates that the solution exists. It may, however, not be unique. We invite our colleagues to identify alternate solutions, end quote. So, yeah, exactly. They wanted people talking about this. Now, this thought experiment has had a lot of criticisms, <laughs> as you might imagine. <laughs> a lot say the dinosauroid is just too human-like. Some scientists have said that if Stenonychosaurus had kept evolving, it would keep its theropod body and be more horizontal than vertical with a long tail. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good assumption considering theropods evolved for like 160 million years, and they all stayed pretty horizontal. Some of them got a little bit more upright, like a Dinochirus or Therizinosaurus or something, but they all still had the tail and everything. Mm -hmm. Saying that another 50, 60 million years, they would have gone fully vertical is a weird stretch. I guess you could also look at birds today. Most birds, I guess they could go kind of upright if they wanted to. Yeah. Yeah, but you're right. Even in the case of birds, which do basically have no tail left, mm -hmm. they more or less walk horizontally or nearly horizontally. And they still lay eggs. Yeah. <laughs> they did lose the teeth, though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, some of those things happened. They might just be combining bird evolution with human evolution, though. Could and be. getting to the lack of teeth thing. Isn't that the fun with thought experiments, though? Yeah. You could go anywhere. I think the, the main criticism from it is sort of like the T-Rex being a scavenger. Mm -hmm. It's not always clear that it's a sort of tongue-in-cheek, a little bit thought experiment. Sometimes it seems like a more serious proposal, mm -hmm. especially because there was a documentary watched from the 80s where they had the dinosauroid and they were like, this is what we think it would have looked like. Right. Not like, here's one 
very remote possible idea. And wouldn't it be funny if this happened? Yeah. It seemed more like a serious consideration. My guess is this thought experiment took off because they had their illustrations. Mm -hmm. And the actual model of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just like today with if you have good paleo art to go with it, people, it really draws attention. Is the dinosauroid good paleo art? <laughs> I mostly mean like colorful and available. <laughs> eye <-catching>. Yeah, eye catching. <laughs> now, it's possible that there are eggs and nests found in the two medicine formation in Montana that belong to Stenonicosaurus, which is why I said it might also be in Montana. But these eggs and nests have been thought to be Orodromaeus, then later Troodon, and then Van der Reese and Curry said, well, maybe it's Stenonicosaurus. Stinonychosaurus lived on a warm coastal floodplain that was covered by forests. Also known as a swamp. Good point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the way I think about swamps has changed now mm -hmm. since prehistoric planet. And other dinosaurs that lived around the same time and place as Stinonychosaurus include Displetosaurus, Gorgosaurus, Lambiosaurus, Carithosaurus, Procerolophus, Styracosaurus, Centrosaurus, Chasmosaurus, Edmontonia, Stegoceras, and foraminocephaly. And euoplocephalus. Oh, yes. Forgot one. And that's a wide range of different types of dinosaurs. Was that ceratopsians and chylosaurs? Of course, theropods. Hadrosaurs. Yep. Tyrannosaur. Oh, yeah. You're, <laughs> you're getting more specific for me. I said theropods. <laughs> oh, true. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So that is Stinonychosaurus in a nutshell and the dinosauroid. But we've got more on the dinosauroid. Loosely related, I would say. My news item is very closely related because it's about <laughs> dinosaur intelligence and where it could have gone evolutionarily. It's more focused on the brain side of it than the body side of it, like oh. the original dinosauroid discussion. Nice. And I'll get into that discussion about dinosaur intelligence and where it could have gotten if they hadn't gone extinct after a quick sponsor break. So getting into uh, how intelligent dinosaurs could have gotten if it wasn't for that pesky asteroid. <laughs> that led to us humans being here today. <laughs> I guess pesky in terms of dinosaur perception. There was a neuroscientist took a different approach to the question of the dinosauroid feasibility. They didn't specifically talk about the dinosauroid, but... They definitely did. It's actually the first sentence of the abstract mentions oh. Dale Russell and the dinosauroid. Well, that just shows you who read this paper. <laughs> <laughs> I can see why you think they didn't necessarily talk about the dinosauroid because the title of the paper is Could Theropod Dinosaurs Have Evolved to a Human Level of Intelligence? Mm. It doesn't say anything about dinosauroid or troodontids even for that matter. And this paper was published in the Journal of Comparative Neurology and written by Anton Reiner. And the gist of their analysis is that bird brains and presumably dinosaur brains have a very different structure to human brains. Basically, dinosaur brains don't have as many specialized areas as humans. And because of the organization of dinosaurs' brains, if they had added more neuron groups, they would have ended up being less efficient than similar mammal brains. Interesting. So they basically don't scale up as well physically or intelligence-wise as mammal brains do. Hmm. So unlike mammals, dinosaur brains get less efficient as they get larger because as their brains get larger, they have to rely on longer axons, which are less efficient than shorter axons. But mammals have a different strategy, so we don't have to have as long of axons as our brains get bigger. Hmm. Also, because of their brain organization, bird brains can't fold up like our cerebral cortex, which increases the surface area and improves our cognitive function. So bird brains aren't as wrinkly as our brains? Yeah, not at all. Which is why if you've ever seen one of those CT scans of like a bird endocast, mm -hmm. the, it's all smooth. <laughs> <laughs> and the bird brains that we see today are also smooth to match like that smooth skull. Interesting. Whereas our brain, like our skull is pretty smooth. But the brain inside it is a totally different shape with all the little wrinkles all over the place. Mm -hmm. So Reiner acknowledges it's impossible to know if any dinosaur may have eventually evolved new brain adaptations to increase efficiency or cognitive function in another way. At least any non-avian dinosaur, right? Because they died off. Yes, I guess. But we also don't know if any bird might in the future. Oh, that's true. 
He also acknowledges that birds like corvids and parrots parallel intelligence of non-human primates in many ways. Mm -hmm. So there are birds that are really intelligent and manage to do all sorts of problem solving, different social interactions and things with their brains the way that they are. Mm -hmm. And that mammals shouldn't be considered more intelligent than birds in general. It's not like, oh, we have this mammal brain, so we're better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because depending on the species, there's a lot of variation and there are a lot of birds that are smarter than a lot of mammals. It's not better, it's just different. Yes. However, it does seem likely that dinosaur brains have some limitations that are sort of inherent to the way that they're structured that would probably stop them from reaching human-level intelligence. The way they put it was, quote, the two starting points, the reptilian and the mammalian, may have seemed trivially different at the outset, yet the differences may have constrained the limit of what could be evolved from them, end quote. So in other words, evolution is very weird, and you never know what features are going to turn out to be really useful and important in the future. And lucky for us, our ancestors happened to have brains that were easier to scale up in size and intelligence than dinosaurs. So the idea that if Troodon hadn't gone extinct and had kept evolving, that his brain would have gotten more and more advanced yeah. to the point of humans, and then as a result, it would have ended up being a human-shaped body, is probably built on an entirely false premise that their brain would have been able to get the way our brain is. Yes, Steinonychosaurus too. Yes, and if they had develop some new strategy of having a, a more intelligent brain and higher cognitive function, it would have been in a different way. So it probably also would have had a very different body. <laughs> yes. Maybe it would have become aquatic. Yeah, it could have been. <laughs> or it could have flown like a lot of intelligent dinosaurs. Who knows? Well, it turns out that the debate on what made the non-avian dinosaurs go extinct is still going on. Though there are more arguments in favor of the Chicxulub impact. Yeah, I should say so. I thought the debate was pretty much settled. I think it pretty much is. Depends who you talk to. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so yeah, would the dinosaurs have gone extinct if not for the Chicxulub impact? Or was there something else? This was Alfio Chiarenza and Steve Brusati wrote this for Reference Module in Life Sciences, and it's called Extinction Theories for Dinosaurs. There's two leading hypotheses on why dinosaurs went extinct. There's the asteroid and all the terrible things that happened after, like the fires, the tsunamis, the earthquakes, the nuclear winter, and more. The other hypothesis is that dinosaurs were gradually in decline already, possibly because of a lot of volcanoes erupting. So why am I bringing this up for our dinosauroid episode? Well, if dinosaurs weren't in decline and the asteroid hadn't hit Earth, then yes, Deinonychosaurus in theory could have kept evolving till today. It also turns out that Dale Russell, who he did the thought experiment on the dinosauroid, didn't think dinosaurs were in decline. He published about that in 1984. So let's go back a bit. Dinosaurs according to this paper, quote, diversified into a dizzying variety of shapes, dietary habits, and sizes, ranging from colossal long-necked sauropods larger than Boeing 737 aircraft to feathered gliders no larger than pigeons, end quote. I just like the way that they described it. <laughs> <laughs> but then at the end of the Cretaceous, that's the most recent of the big five mass extinctions on Earth, it claimed up to 75% of all species, not just dinosaurs. Yeah, all sorts of different animals went extinct, like all those marine reptiles too, mm -hmm. and pterosaurs. For most of the 20th century, the most accepted theory was that dinosaurs died because of long-term climate changes, but that's back when we were thinking of dinosaurs as very reptile-like and cold-blooded. Then we've got the mid-1990s and Feathered dinosaurs were found in China, and we realized dinosaurs were bird-like and active. Also, in the 1980s, that's when we got the Alvarez hypothesis about the asteroid. And more fossils started being found all over the world, even Alaska and Antarctica, which, quote, helped reveal dinosaurs to be a global empire that adapted to many climates and environments, not merely overgrown tropical ectothermic reptilian beasts. <laughs> <laughs> they have a nice way with words. Yeah. There is evidence that dinosaurs were in decline. Since the 1980s, paleontologists have found fewer dinosaur species that lived in the Maastrichtian, that was 72 to 66 million years ago, compared to the Campanian, which was 
83 to 72 million years ago. And yeah, that might mean that there was a decline in dinosaur diversity, but it seems the evidence currently shows that dinosaurs were in decline in what is now North America and not necessarily other parts of the world, which had a lot of diverse types of dinosaurs and actually, in some cases, shows that they were thriving. Yeah, there's also differences between which groups of dinosaurs. If you take dinosaurs as a whole versus if you look at just, say, ceratopsians or hadrosaurs, you get a different answer. Yeah. Now, Earth did go through a lot of temperature changes, and there were sea level fluctuations and a lot of shifting of the continents. But there's, quote, no convincing evidence that these Cretaceous changes were any more severe than those that occurred in the Jurassic or Triassic, which did not cause noticeable changes in dinosaur biodiversity, much less their total extinction, end quote. Plus, as you were mentioning, Garrett, after the asteroid, a lot of other animals that have been around for hundreds of millions of years disappeared, and a bunch of food chains collapsed. Now, going back to the biases, North America is, quote, the best sampled region. So most late Cretaceous dinosaurs so far have been found in North America, specifically Western North America, and only recently have we started finding more fossils found in other parts of the world. Also, the fossil record itself is biased because some areas are better at preserving fossils and some are just easier for people to go to to excavate. Yeah, also some environments are better at preserving fossils. So for example, if things dry out just globally, you're going to get less fossilization Mm -hmm. because you got less lakes and sedimentation and stuff like that. True. So we can't just go by species count to figure out if dinosaurs were in decline. And we also can only study what fossils have been found. We don't know about the fossils that we haven't found, the absent data. Paleontology, we just don't know as much about other parts of the world in the late Cretaceous as we do North America at this point. As the paper says, quote, our fossil sample is nowhere near complete. So for correcting this sampling bias, the author said that, quote, there was a high and relatively stable diversity of dinosaurs preceding the mass extinction and also preceding the bolide impact, the asteroid, and what appears to be the largest pulses of Deccan volcanism, end quote. And Dale Russell first wrote about this in a 1984 study, which the author said, quote, surprisingly received little attention and few citations, but turned out to be prescient, end quote. That's that the asteroid happened right before. So that's just to say that Dale Russell didn't think that dinosaurs were on their way out before the mass extinction. And he wrote about this in a 1984 paper, but it didn't get too much attention at the time. And maybe that's why he came up with that thought experiment in the first place. He thought, well, they weren't on their way out. What could have happened? (laughs) And then, Garrett, as you were saying, too, when you think about different groups of dinosaurs, each group of dinosaurs probably evolving and changing in different ways during the late Cretaceous. So some groups might have been or actually were doing better than others. The authors said they acknowledge, yeah, there's some studies that argue that dinosaurs were in decline. And they said they're going to keep an open mind as to how dinosaurs may have changed. But they wanted to pose the question, quote, were these declines biologically meaningful? Oh, in other words, were the declines big enough to lead to extinction? Yes. Now, the debate on dinosaur extinction has changed as we learn more about fossils and geological records, because we do know that there was an abrupt extinction event. There was something or a series of somethings that happened very quickly. And going back, there's two leading ideas, that there's the asteroid and then there's volcanism. Again, we've talked a lot about the impact crater. But the Deccan Traps, which I guess we talked a lot about that recently in our prehistoric planet episode on the Badlands. Mm -hmm. There are these lava flows, they were erupting in what is now India, and they left behind basalt rock that covers about 500,000 square kilometers. It's really hard to date the Deccan eruptions because some of them apparently could last hundreds of thousands of years. But the author said that there's at least one pulse that happened during the late Cretaceous, and this was several million years before the asteroid impact. Then there was another pulse during the Paleogene, after the impact. But the largest one happened around the end of the Cretaceous. Interesting. Yeah, the thing I had read most recently when we were talking in the Badlands episode was that the largest pulse happened just after the end of the Cretaceous, Yeah, not before. But this one is, I guess, hedging it. It's just saying it's like, it was around it. (laughs) Yes, because it's really hard to date, it sounds like. Yeah. 
I mean, it is a lot easier to date than many things because the chemistry of it actually changes. So you can do real radiometric dating, but it sounds like you'd need to take a lot of samples in order to really map out just how much of it came out at what point in time. Yeah. I think you were saying this too when we were talking about with the prehistoric planet episode that volcanism was the main killer for a lot of other mass extinction events. Yeah, that's definitely been proposed, especially when you're going Triassic to Jurassic, I think, and Permian to Triassic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's why it was a popular theory for the dinosaurs going extinct. It just made sense. It made other things go extinct at other points in time. There was also some climate change that may have been from the volcanism in the late Cretaceous. As for the Chicxulub impact... Dinosaurs just, and we've talked a lot about this too, I think Riley Black might have been talking about that when she was on the show, just dinosaurs didn't have anything that would help them when the impact happened, because they were mostly medium to large in size, their eggs took a long time to incubate, took them a little while to grow into adults, they couldn't easily burrow or hide, a lot of them had specialized diets. Yeah, and the ones that had less specialized diets and could were small enough to get into burrows and all that survived into birds. <laughs> yes. Also, mammals survived, or at least our ancestral mammals. <laughs> yeah, some mammals. <laughs> some did. mammals. Yeah. The small ones that were generalist eaters that could burrow and hide. We still don't know why some birds survived while all the non avian dinosaurs went extinct. It probably helped that they grew fast and they had strong flight muscles and they could eat seeds. We've talked about the seeds before and how no birds today have teeth. Oh, so they were all like seed specialists, maybe? <laughs> could be, or at least they, you know, they were just able to, if not specialists. That's interesting. So the authors are saying, well, dinosaur diversity doesn't seem like it was affected when there were volcanic eruptions, but dinosaurs were really affected by the impact crater. So based on that, it seems a lot more likely that they went extinct because of Chicxulub. But they also say there's still a lot of questions to answer and research to do, quote, so our interpretations may change in the future. And, and that, that is what science is all about. If new facts or evidence comes to light, then you change your position. We do have a lot of evidence, though, that it was the Chicxulub impact. <laughs> well, so just I'll quickly mention there's an abstract by Gerda Keller et al. for the European Geosciences Union General Assembly this year that says that Deccan volcanism is what killed the dinosaurs. And they found some glass spherules from the Chicxulub impact in sediments that were 200,000 to 230,000 years older than the KPG mass extinction. So these papers, they're still coming out. I think we will be debating this for a while. And again, I am surprised because. I kind of thought we'd all collectively decided, but we haven't. <laughs> I'm very skeptical of this, partly because 200,000 to 230,000 years is a very, very short amount of time in the fossil record. True. So proving that it was 200,000 years before the KPG boundary is going to be really hard because sometimes things also get mixed around too. You don't, it's not always perfect. It's mm -hmm. not always the exact precise layer cake. And yeah, there's a lot of existing evidence to overcome. The burden of proof is definitely on people saying it's not Chicxulub at this point. Mm -hmm. We've got one more news item. I want to thank Eric, one of our patrons for sending us this one. And it's about how Troodon could change its body temperature and likely brooded its eggs in nests shared with other female Troodon. So in other words, groups of female Troodons sharing nests? Yes, and they could change their body temperatures depending on what they needed. This was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences by Mattia Tagliavento and others. I wanted to include this news item in our dinosauroid episode because Steinonychosaurus and Troodon are closely related. Or maybe the same thing, depending on who you ask. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> maybe Troodon isn't even really a dinosaur. <laughs> I think it is, but we'll see. The debate continues. That seems to be the secondary theme of this episode. <laughs> that debate is much more relevant, I think, than the Chicxulub impact versus Deccan traps. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Well, we'll see. <laughs> so what does it all mean for with this Troodon paper? Well, 
Dinosaurs evolving into birds meant that there were a lot of changes, including in body temperature and how they reproduced and nesting. And Troodon helped show some of these changes. So the team studied bird eggs from chickens, sparrows, wrens, emus, kiwis, cassowaries, and ostriches, as well as reptile eggs from turtles, crocodiles, and alligators, and Troodon eggshells. We know that that's Troodon because of embryos found with the eggs. This is from the Oldman Formation. So this team of scientists believe Troodon to be valid. Yep. Well, I mean, whether or not it's Troodon specifically, or it's another Troodontid, or Stenonicosaurus, or whatever, mm. it's still relevant, right? Yeah. It's just a it's a rose by any other name. <laughs> <laughs> so they used dual clumped isotope thermometry, which is a way to measure and reconstruct body temperatures of dinosaurs, and they compared eggshell mineralization processes. Also known as the paleo thermometer. Yes. Now, most dinosaurs we think laid their eggs in mass and then incubated them like reptiles by covering their nests. But some derived theropods, like Ovaraptorids, seem like they brooded their eggs. We don't know for sure if they used their body heat to incubate them, but they were in, in nests similar to birds. We're pretty confident with Ovaraptor, though, because we found several fossilized Ovaraptor on top of nests that yeah. seem to be their own eggs. That's true. So it does seem likely. They also had two functional oviducts like reptiles. Birds only have one. And it turns out Troodon had some reptile and bird-like characteristics. When the team studied the bird eggs, they found that those eggs mineralize much faster and more effectively than reptiles. And they could tell by the patterns in the eggshells. Again, birds only have the one functioning ovary. In Troodon, the patterns in the eggshells show that Troodon eggs mineralize more like reptiles, more slowly. So it seems that Troodon had two functional ovaries based on the eggshells being more like a reptile's. I think also in some of the nests there are pairs of eggs that seem like they were laid in pairs. <laughs> yeah. And knowing that the eggs mineralize more like reptiles makes it easier to estimate the number of eggs an individual Troodon would lay. Based on previous studies, Troodon weighed about 50 kilograms or 110 pounds, and the egg had 50 to 60 grams or roughly two ounces of calcite. Based on that information, a single Troodon could have a clutch size of four to six eggs, and that helps support the hypothesis that Troodon nests, which had up to 24 eggs, were communal from four to six females laying their eggs together. Oh, interesting. I've never thought about, I know there are the communal sites mm -hmm. we've talked about lots of times where it's like, oh, there's a whole bunch of dinosaurs and they're all hanging out together. But how many? And that was even in the most recent prehistoric planet. There was an oviraptor on a nest and there were a bunch of them, you know, and there was a dinosaur that snuck up and stole one of the eggs, mm -hmm. but they were all in a group together with their nest, but they're all in their own nests. They weren't sharing a nest. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. I think the Isisaurus had more of the communal nest, but that's a sauropod. They didn't brood at all, though. That's true. They just bailed. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, well, modern birds like ostriches also have communal nests with two to seven per nest. Wow. Yeah, I, I didn't, didn't know, know that. that. <laughs> Weird ostriches. <laughs> now, because the patterns of Troodon eggshells are similar to reptiles, it implies their, quote, isotopic composition directly reflects eggshell formation temperature and thus body temperature, end quote. So we can tell the body temperature of Troodon based on the temperature of the eggshell formation. Mm -hmm. Yep. And tells you the temperature of the mom. Yep. Before they laid the egg. <laughs> <laughs> now of the four Troodon eggshells in this study, three were estimated to be about 42 degrees Celsius, which is about 107 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's similar to modern birds' body temperatures. Because Troodon was so warm, then Maybe it partly incubated the eggs with its body heat, or in other words, it brooded. The fourth eggshell was colder. That was about 29 degrees Celsius or 84 degrees Fahrenheit. The colder temperature was similar to temperatures in previous studies of oviraptorids. So these different temperatures help show that Troodon was heterothermic. Its body temperature varied with the environment. It was, quote, capable of voluntarily reducing its metabolic rate like modern birds, end quote. Oh, yeah. Sort of like a little hibernation style thing, but not quite as intense. Yeah. And that might have been key to eventually leading to true endothermy, where you generate your own body heat. Cool. 
So yeah, definitely. Uh, it's interesting. It had, like I said, the characteristics of reptiles and birds. And who knows, maybe Stenonychosaurus did something similar. We're going to take a quick ad break and then move on to our dinosaur connection challenge, which as Garrett mentioned is about politics. Okay, we're going to take a break from the dinosauroids and dinosauroid related items to go to our dinosaur connection challenge, which this week the topic is politics. Thank you to Saskasaurus for suggesting that, that one. You can suggest dinosaur connection challenge topics if you're a patron of ours. So I'm just going to start by saying politics, oof. <laughs> <laughs> the two things that we like have a rule about never talking about on the show are religion and politics. Yes, we, we say we're a family-friendly show and we're all about the dinos. But I did find a few fun ways to connect dinosaurs to politics. And actually, maybe it won't surprise our listeners because... These are the same ways we've talked about in a few other episodes. <laughs> yeah. I guess we do. Occasionally, there have been things that connect dinosaurs to politics, like national monuments or something, and we do talk about those. But State dinosaurs. Yeah. Oh, I'm giving it away. It is technically politics, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start, though, with books. There's a book by Brian Noble called Articulating Dinosaurs, A Political Anthropology, if that sounds familiar, we interviewed him way back in episode 95. You can hear more details there. The book looks at T-Rex and Myasaura and how paleontology and politics influence them. Some examples he talks about is how Henry Fairfield Osborne's politics shaped how we saw T-Rex as the tyrant king. And then Jack Horner named Myasaura the good mother lizard during the rise of second wave feminism, which I didn't realize or maybe I had forgotten about. It's been a while since that interview. Yes. Uh, the book is described as an interdisciplinary case study of the two dinosaurs, and it also talks about media and museums and other disciplines. There's another book. I haven't read this one yet, but it popped up in my search when I was doing the search for this topic, and it's called Hella by David Gerald. It's a science fiction novel about a young man who's 12 to 13 year olds lives on Hella, which is a planet where due to lower gravity compared to Earth, everything is supersized, including the dinosaurs. According to reviews in the book's description, there's a lot of political machinations and some sort of political conspiracy. Now, the reviews are mixed. Some, well, most people seem to like it, but it doesn't sound like there's a whole lot of dinosaurs other than maybe when they attack people. On the more research or academic side, there was a study published in Nature Human Behavior in 2017 by Feng Shu et al. that found that paleontology books are bipartisan. They analyzed nearly one and a half million books and the purchase histories on Amazon and Barnes and Noble online for 25 million purchases. And they looked at what the retailers suggested people also buy according to their interests. So they categorized political books and then they analyzed what science books people bought after buying those political books. Mm. There are some limitations to the study, like it didn't use a random sample of books and they relied on how the online retailers categorized the books. But it was still cool that people no matter what their politics were, they like dinosaur books. <laughs> Who doesn't like dinosaurs? Right. <laughs> a little bit more in academia. There's courses about dinosaurs and politics. Uh, Pomona College had a cultural politics of dinosaurs course. Uh, another example is the University of Arkansas's The Science, Politics, and Culture of Dinosaurs. There's a preview lecture online. The course description says they'll cover topics, quote, related to dinosaur research, such as land use policy, there we go. We talk about the parks, mm -hmm. paleo art, science communication, and the business of fossil sales. Oh, yeah. I, I guess fossil sales could also be politics. So we, in that sense, have covered politics before. That's true. Uh, speaking of land use policy, laws affect where and whether you can collect fossils in a particular area, which we've also talked about. Hey, maybe we're more political than we realize. <laughs> <laughs> I guess what I think not being political, I think like not expressing preferences to a particular party yeah but we're we're very much on the i guess academic side of it yeah yeah now laws vary by country and even by state or province for example in alberta canada you can't excavate any fossils and if you find any you should report the find in the u.s if you're searching for fossils on federal land you'll need a permit and fossils you collect remain public property they go to museums universities or other public institutions for people to study and exhibit and then last, but certainly not least, I already hinted, well, straight up said earlier, 
Politics determine if a dinosaur is a state dinosaur. In episode 425, so not that long ago, Garrett, you had a fun fact about this, so I'll just give a quick overview. So when we recorded the episode, there were only a few U.S. states that didn't have state fossils. Iowa, New Hampshire, Hawaii, and Rhode Island. No one had claimed Tyrannosaurus rex yet. They still haven't. Also, when we recorded that episode, there were 18 states plus Washington, D.C. that had a state dinosaur and or dinosaur as a state fossil. And I keep mentioning as of that recording because I have an update. But first, as Garrett mentioned in his fun fact, in terms of the non-avian dinosaurs that have been selected so far, just as a recap, Acrocanthosaurus is the Oklahoma state dinosaur. There's Arkansas for Arkansas, Astrodon for Maryland, Augustinolophus for California, Capitolosaurus for Washington, D.C., Coelophysis for New Mexico, Dilophosaurus for Connecticut, Dryptosaurus for Delaware, Hadrosaurus for New Jersey, Myasaurus for Montana, Parasaurus for Missouri, Podocosaurus for Massachusetts, Paluxysaurus slash Sauroposidon for Texas, Sonorosaurus for Arizona, Stegosaurus for Colorado, Triceratops for Wyoming as the state dinosaur and South Dakota as the state fossil, and Utah Raptor for Utah. But I have a couple of updates to add. So, Arictodromaeus is now Idaho's state dinosaur as of March 31st of this year. That's the burrowing dinosaur, the one that we're always going down Arictodromaeus burrows with. <laughs> nice. <laughs> that one was, it was championed by L.J. Krumenacher, an adjunct professor of geosciences at Idaho State University and affiliate curator at the Idaho Museum of Natural History. He worked with fourth graders from the Yukon Elementary who started the process in 2022, so it only took him about a year or less, depending on when in 2022. And Krumenacher wrote the first description of Arictodromaeus specimens found in Idaho, so it's all very fitting. Yeah. For some reason, I always think Arictodromaeus is in Montana because we saw it at the Museum of the Rockies. Oh. And that's where a lot of the Arictodromaeus research <laughs> came from researchers over there. But Idaho is close, so it makes sense. Mm-hmm. The other update is Sushasaurus rex is now Washington State's state dinosaur. Yeah. It just recently got the governor's signature. I know you're not the biggest fan <laughs> of Sushasaurus rex. Because it's not a real dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> it, they, they've got a bone. It was a dinosaur bone found in Washington State. Yes. Yeah. But Sushasaurus doesn't mean anything. Anyway, this process <laughs> came about because of a fourth grade class. It took them four years to get the state dino. It's interesting. It often seems to be specifically fourth graders who get their state dinosaurs. Is that peak dinosaur interest age? Maybe. Like nine-year-olds, eight-year-olds, ten-year-olds? Yeah, nine to ten or maybe eight to nine. Mm, it's been a while. I can't remember exactly. Probably eight to ten. Just give it a plus or minus one yeah. on it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of connections between dinosaurs and politics. Yeah. So lightening it up a little bit, I got a fun fact about butterflies. Ooh, aye, aye, aye. Little butterfly. Is that a DDR reference? It was. <laughs> I used to be really into DDR. Mm -hmm. We still have it somewhere. Yeah. But the fun fact is that most dinosaurs never got the chance to see a butterfly, but some did. Oh, well, that's nice. So according to a massive new study published in Nature, Ecology, and Evolution, I counted 88 authors affiliated with 65 organizations. Oh, it is massive. It was crazy. I always like copy and paste the list of authors into my notes so that I can search for authors and see like if I've cited them before. Mm -hmm. And it's the biggest list I've ever seen. It's the first time I've ever seen an author list basically put in the supplemental materials at the end of the paper because it was <laughs> too long for the first. They didn't want the whole first page to just be authors. Mm -hmm. They needed this many people because there are so many butterflies they wanted to study. So they sampled 2,244 butterfly species, which includes 92% of recognized genera from 90 different countries. Wow. They sampled DNA from all the butterflies and constructed a huge phylogenetic family tree. They found that butterflies originated from, quote, their nocturnal herbivorous moth ancestors, end quote, between 100 and 102.5 million years ago. Hmm which is right at the start of the late Cretaceous, right on the boundary between early and late Cretaceous. They also found 
all but one family of butterflies were around before dinosaurs went extinct. Oh, wow. I didn't realize butterflies had been around so long. Yeah, me either. I don't know a ton about invertebrates, but... (laughs) No. Other than I like to look at butterflies. They are pretty. Fossil butterflies are extremely rare. A study by Rink de Young in 2016 identified just 48 fossil butterfly species identified from only 142 fossils. So in other words, we have more Coelophysis fossils than all of butterflies combined. (laughs) That number 142 might be missing a few, but... Still, we have so many more dinosaurs than we have butterflies, which is pretty crazy considering today there are over 2,000 butterfly species. Mm -hmm. You'd think we could find a few more in the fossil record, but they just don't fossilize very well. I was just going to say they seem like they'd be too fragile. I mean, they're fragile enough even just trying to preserve them in a museum. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Hoping that they get preserved in the rock just right is pretty unlikely. The oldest fossil that we have for a butterfly is 55 million years old from Denmark. And so based on that, a lot of people had said dinosaurs might not have ever seen butterflies. Mm -hmm. I don't know if a lot of people said that, but a lot of people thought they weren't around in the Cretaceous. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But this new analysis, the cool thing when you have DNA of all these animals is you can sort of reconstruct the family tree and see about how many mutations would have happened between these different distant relatives and estimate back how far their common ancestor goes. Mm. And that's how they got to that 100 million year ago estimate. Butterflies are thought to have evolved along with flowering plants. Most butterflies only eat one specific plant or at most a few closely related plants. A lot of butterflies eat different plants, meaning different species eat different plants. It's not like all butterflies eat just one plant. Right. Otherwise, we would have a (laughs) lot fewer types of butterflies, I imagine. Probably, yeah. There's over 300 different families of plant that are eaten by different butterflies. So. It's not always just one per family of plant. You know, there's some overlap, but still a lot of diversity there. For example, we have a milkweed plant in our yard for monarch butterflies. From the National Wildlife Foundation, they say, quote, milkweed produces glycoside toxins to deter animals from eating them, but monarchs have evolved immunity to those toxins. As they feed, monarch caterpillars store up the toxins in their body, making them taste bad, which in turn deters their predators. Oh, that's good. The toxins remain in their system even after metamorphosis, protecting them as adult butterflies as well, end quote. That's a neat trick. It is. It's very cool. A lot of animals have that trick of eat something toxic and then it becomes your toxin, Mm -hmm. (laughs) which is pretty, pretty awesome. I also think it's really cool. Metamorphosis is such a crazy change. Oh, yeah. It's impressive because it's basically just the caterpillars that eat. The adults don't really eat in a lot of butterfly species. So the fact that they can just hold on to it and rejigger it in their body so that they still are poisonous to things that might eat them is really cool. Not all butterflies eat living plants, though. From the study, they say, quote, most butterflies in our data set are herbivores as larvae. A small number also feed on detritus, lichens, or other insects, end quote. Mm. So they're actually predatory butterflies. I had no idea. Well, I guess they're predatory caterpillars, but... Yeah. But when I think of caterpillars, I don't think, yeah, predators. Yeah. And also eating detritus. So I guess like decaying leaves and then lichen, which is sort of like, I don't know, a fuzzy moss, but not quite a moss. Interestingly, even though dinosaurs, most dinosaurs didn't get a chance to see butterflies, virtually all of them probably saw moths. Hmm. We have fossilized moss going all the way back to 190 million years ago, which is the early Jurassic. So just that alone is enough to tell you that most dinosaurs saw moths. Mm -hmm. But estimates put the first moths at around 300 million years ago in the Carboniferous, which is two periods before the Mesozoic when dinosaurs showed up. Wow. Moths have been around that long. Yeah. And the current theory, like these researchers said, how butterflies originated from their nocturnal herbivorous moth ancestors. Mm Mm-hmm. So butterflies are basically a subset of moths. If you use moths as a monophyletic group, butterflies just are moths. Yeah. (laughs) It's just a special type of moth. Generally more colorful, I think. Yep. And they're up in the daytime rather than usually at night. Some other differences. Is that why we like them better than moths? (laughs) They're pretty. (laughs) And they don't eat our clothes. (laughs) Oh, yeah. There's that too. (laughs) Well, that wraps up this episode, this dinosauroid 
special episode of I Know Dino. Thank you for listening. Stay tuned. Next week, we will get back to there's been a number of new dinosaurs discovered. And if you like this episode, or if you like our show in general, please tell a friend. Thanks again, and until next time. Sit down, watching me walk on my dinosaur.